1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to look at verses 3 through 5 tonight. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 through 5. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we give thanks again for this time of gathering together with your people. And I pray tonight as we look at this passage of Scripture that you would remind us of your mercy towards us. And Lord, that we would be mindful of that which you have reserved and protected in heaven Lord, that we would be mindful that we too are being protected by your power. Lord, remind us of your promises, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I've said it a number of times, and I'll say it again, that sound theology always begins and ends with doxology. It's something that we've wore out the last several weeks, sound theology begins and ends with doxology. That's what we've been looking at in Ephesians so much of is that when we talk about um, theology, that it ought to lead us to praise and worship. It's important that we remember that lest these things become something too familiar or they become something uh, sterile or they become something that do not move our heart and our soul. As we've been looking at 1 Peter, if you were with us last week, uh, we began with the recipients and we talked about how in much of that has to do with our salvation. It has to do with who he's talking to. You'll recall that when we looked at that, we saw that Peter was addressing those who were the chosen elect, uh, those who were scattered to serve and set apart by the Holy Spirit of God, those who have been uh, redeemed and forgiven, those who have been purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we talked about that last week, uh, that the Holy Spirit has set us apart to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ended that, if you'll recall, in verse number 2, where Peter writes these words, he says, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. And as we talked about that last week, last week, um, as recipients of God's grace and his peace, we should, he's he's praying in a sense, uh, he's blessing them in a sense that they would uh, experience the grace and peace of God in maximum allotment. And in doing so, as Peter goes through this theology, it ought to make us want to praise God. It ought to make us want to worship God. You know, it's something that I think when we think about our own study of theology, does it move us to awe? Does it move us to worship Him? And if it doesn't, then there's something wrong there. I've been in classrooms and over the years, seminary and Bible college, where it's somewhat sterile, but I've also been in those classrooms where I've just been moved to worship God. And certainly, as we think about what Paul is, or what Peter is talking about, you don't have to excuse that because I'm dealing with Paul on, on Sunday morning. As Peter is talking about, as he's addressing these folks, and he talks about this grace that we may experience, this grace. Again, it should move us to praise God, and that's exactly what Peter does. In fact, he begins in verse number 3 with these words, Blessed be the God and Father of our 
Lord Jesus Christ. And that word blessed is a word that we're familiar with. We've looked at that before. It's a word in the Greek where we derive the word eulogy from. And it sounds strange to talk about God in this way, to eulogize God, because usually when we're thinking about eulogizing someone, we're thinking about that in in terms of a funeral. But we're eulogizing, we're speaking a word, uh, speaking praise to God. And and that's what Peter begins with, that we're to uh, bless God. Uh, not just God. He said, blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to highlight a couple things in this first part of uh, verse 1 where we see this. And, and the first thing that I want to note about this is as he's talking about blessing God or praising God is that he reminds us that God is the source of all of our blessings, specifically of spiritual blessings And we've highlighted this in Ephesians already, but right here, as we will see, when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, he begins to talk about what he's done. And God is the source of this. And by the way, he tells the church to do this. And I say it's the church because the church is the recipients. Those are, it is he that he is talking to. We're to bless God. We're to praise God getting ahead of myself, but, but I'll just emphasize this, that no one else can praise God but the church. Lost people cannot praise God. Oh, yeah, they can bless God and they can give thanks to God. But notice how he puts this. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who bless God do so through the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in other words, it speaks of our relationship. He's our Father because He's the Lord's Father. Because He is the Father of Jesus, and we have been adopted into the family of God, and we are now children of God, uh, we have access to our Father. He's only our Father because of the Son. Lost people, when they try to worship God or give thanks to God. You ever notice this? I, 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 one of the phrases that just irritates me so much is when they will make the remark, the man upstairs. The man upstairs has blessed me. Well, I, I know when you're talking about the man upstairs that you're not talking about the one whom we worship. Now, there is a God-man in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father But we don't simply address him in vague ways as praise God, uh, praise the man upstairs. We we, we don't do that, but we praise him specifically for who he is. In other words, blessing the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it, it is through Jesus Christ that we have come to know the one true living God. In fact, that's eternal life is to know him, the one true living God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. How often should we be praising Him? Well, we ought to be praising Him all the time. Not just here when we gather, but we ought to praise Him. We took a little time out last week in our prayer time to emphasize that that, that we we ought to start our prayer night every week with praise and blessing to God. Well, we ought to praise Him when we wake up in the morning. We ought to praise Him when we go to sleep at night. We ought to praise Him all day long. We don't have to wake to the church. Well, we ought to praise Him at home. We ought to praise Him at work. God is to be praised all the time because God is worthy of our praise and blessing. And by the way, the way Peter words this when he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word be is actually supplied there for us just for our reading But really what he's saying is bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless him. And that's what we're to do. We're to praise him. So I want to talk about tonight, I mean, there are many and certainly numerous reasons for blessing him. As we've talked about, even in Ephesians, we know that every spiritual blessing comes from him, that God the Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. And James 1, 17 tells us that every good thing and 
given, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom, we, in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God is the source of all of our blessings. And in particular, as Peter addresses in this passage, our spiritual blessings. So that's what I want to emphasize tonight, is the spiritual blessings and why we should praise Him. Now, just get into this very quickly. Uh, I, I just want to give four reasons why we should praise him. Uh, there are numerous reasons, but just kind of based on this passage of Scripture, I want to give us four reasons why we should praise him. And the first reason is uh, for the process of our salvation. I, I don't often alliter alliterate, but uh, I will tonight. But we ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to praise him for the process of our salvation because in this we realize, as we've emphasized even last time, that our salvation originates with him. Notice how he puts this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So two things I would just emphasize in this process of salvation. And one, he gives us the motive. It is by the mercy of God. You see it right there. Who according to his great mercy. It's out of his mercy that he has saved us. Romans 9, 15, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It is God who chose to have mercy upon us. I was reading a quote earlier in the week that said, great sins and great mercies, or great sins and great miseries need great mercy. And many sins and miseries need many Mercer, mercies. So the, the need for mercy really focuses on our plight. We needed mercy because we were helpless and we were wretched and we were sinful. Our minds were corrupt. Our heart was deceitful. When we think about our condition, there was no way in and of ourselves to, to save ourselves. It's only because God had mercy. And his motive is mercy. And we, we see elsewhere that he set his love upon us. Isaiah 38, 17 says of God, It is you who has kept my soul from the pit. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. God gave us mercy when we deserved just wrath. And, and this is what Peter is emphasizing that it's out of his mercy. And then he says this, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So the means of our salvation is that he caused us. Again, God is the originator. He's the one. We, see, we saw that in Ephesians chapter 2, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we were made alive with Christ Jesus. God is the one who caused this. He's the initiator. As Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Nor can we change our nature. Nor can we do anything about our salvation. We had to be born again, born from above. And it was God who caused us to do so. Even as John chapter 1, verse 13 says, That we were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God is the one who caused us to be born again to a living hope. And so we're, we're to praise him because we know, again, he's worthy of the praise. We know that he chose to have mercy upon us. He was compassionate towards us. And, and I understand this, that no matter what happens in my life, and by the way, this is a, a telltale sign of 
what I believe, uh, one of the ways that we can know that we are truly a believer, uh, one, we often talk about do you love God, but another thing is do you praise God? I mean, do you really praise Him? And, and, and I don't mean when things are well. Even the lost people praise God or try to give thanks to God. I was talking to a guy at the gas station the other day, and he was, he was talking about how blessed he was. And my question was, do you know who blessed you? Well, I got too serious then. I want to talk about generalities, but don't get into the specifics. So, so it, the question for the believer is that understanding the mercy that he's had upon us, if he never does anything else but save us, that is certainly far more than we could ever imagine or even hope to have. I recall some years back, uh, my oldest son, his wife was going through a difficult time. She had just had her second miscarriage, and, and I remember that she was, she, was, she was weeping, and my son had come, and he just sat down there beside her and weeped with her. He wept, and and then he just reached over and pulled out his guitar, and they sat there on the floor together and just praised God, just blessed God in the midst of their trial, in the midst of their suffering. So I, I think a good question is, are we repeatedly, no matter what our circumstances, are we blessing God? Are we praising God? Certainly we should bless Him because of our salvation, the process which we know originates with him, and even as we'll see at the end of this, culminates or ends with him. But secondly, it's because of the proof of our salvation. Notice that it says that we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It doesn't say we have a dead hope. We have a living hope. We don't, we have this living hope, and by the way, hope, hope is something that is very powerful Hope will get you through a lot of things. I, I, I remember, seem to have a memory of a lot of stories this week, but I, I recall some time ago in the first church I was, well, second church I was serving, some almost 20 years ago, there was a woman that I went to visit often, and she, she and her husband were... Um, there at home, and, and I would visit with her, and he, was, he would sit and listen, but uh, she was such an upbeat woman. She had cancer, and, I, and, and really, I was just, as I talked to her, I was the one who walked away from those meeting times with them. I, I, was the, I felt like I was more encouraged than she was. And then I went back to visit on another a, a couple of weeks later, and Maybe it was a month, but but it wasn't very long after the last time I'd seen her, and I went to visit her again, and and uh, her husband said that she had just got back from the doctor. Now I had been visiting for months, and she was always upbeat, always hopeful. But she had went to the doctor, and the doctor had told her she had been six months doing chemotherapy, and the doctor said there's basically nothing else I can do for you. It did nothing. And he said, in less than a year, you're going to die. And in less than a week, she was dead. She had lost all hope. I mean, she just completely had turned into a different person. I mean, I, I, I was watch, watching and have a conversation with her, but all that changed. Hope is something that is very powerful, but for us as believers in Christ, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When I think about Peter, who is the writer of this, and Peter, who you'll recall as on that evening when Jesus was arrested, and he watched from a distance. After he was arrested, he watched him be carried away, and then eventually was crucified. I got, I got to think that for Peter, that all his hopes, you know, just, I don't know if you ever think about that, in the time from 
the trial, the crucifixion. And then after the crucifixion, I got to think that Peter, all his hopes about the Messiah had dissipated. I mean, they were all lost because he had an idea, even though Jesus told him exactly what was going to happen, it seems that he was, like the other disciples, were defeated. But as you know, Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, he was raised from the dead. And, I, and so when Peter talks about this living hope, then the proof of this, the, really the proof of our salvation comes through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so we can say along with the Apostle Paul that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. We can say when we go to the grave because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, that, yeah, we, we grieve, but we don't grieve as though who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. We can praise God because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's proof that God accepted his sacrifice. It's proof that Jesus conquered not only our sin, but death in the grave. And, and so it's proof because he lives, we know that we will live. As Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, that if he had not been raised, then our faith is worthless. We would still be in our sins. But he has been raised. And because he lives, we will live. And Jesus would say to those who were standing at the tomb of Lazarus, specifically, he would say to Mary and Martha, that I am the resurrection and the life. That he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And so the proof of our salvation is that Jesus lives, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And the third reason we ought to give him praise is because our, our salvation is guaranteed. As you read verse number four, is that he's, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It speaks about the permanence of our salvation or our inheritance. Now, inheritance is an interesting word there when you use that. There, there's loaded imagery, and we could go to certainly the Jewish background, but let me just talk about what we know about inheritance. We, we think about Inheritance in terms of family. Maybe, maybe you're hoping one day that you're going to get a letter that you had, you had a rich uncle that you didn't even know about, and he has left you an inheritance. Y'all looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Inheritance, we think about family members passing on an inheritance. But the thing about an earthly inheritance... And I think about, I've seen those bumper stickers, and you've probably seen them too, that says that I'm spend, spending my child's inheritance on the back of their car. <laughs> but this inheritance is not an earthly inheritance. This inheritance, well, what is this inheritance? And that's the question, what is this inheritance? He, Peter doesn't really go into detail the only detail really that Peter gives about this inheritance is in terms that it is imperishable, it's undefiled, and will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. But he doesn't tell us exactly what this inheritance is. Now, some have speculated to try to figure out what he's talking about, about this inheritance. And some think that the inheritance that he's talking about, some, some think because the understanding that when... We are saved, that we are become children of God. And as we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, we are adopted as sons. And because we are joint heirs with Christ, some would say that 
Christ is the first one to get the inheritance, but because we're joint heirs with Christ, then everything that belongs to him belongs to us as well. And some would speculate that this inheritance means something else. Uh, Some would say that the inheritance is our full redemption. That that's the inheritance. Some, Some have even said that the inheritance is Jesus himself. That when we die and we, we get Jesus, we, we get him. Again, Peter doesn't speculate, but we know elsewhere from Scripture, as Paul has said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, that things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul would say in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 that he considers the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to compare with the glory that is to be revealed to us. While he doesn't tell us what the inheritance is, he does tell us that it's kept by his power, which is the last reason we ought to praise God based on this passage of Scripture. Not just that he's keeping this inheritance. By the way, it says that it's reserved in heaven for you. You know, the Federal Reserve may go bankrupt tomorrow, but the Heavenly Reserve will be there. Store up your treasures in heaven. It's going to be there. But then he says this. He comes back in verse number 5. He's not only keeping this inheritance, but he's keeping us. There's a lot of ways that verse 5 is read. But obviously he's saying he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. And speaking of those, he says, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Basically what he's telling us is God is the one who keeps us. And it's by his power that we are kept. Now, through faith for a salvation, well, we know that it is by grace through faith that we are saved. But is he talking about the perseverance of the saints here? And while he does address that later, we see perseverance of the saints, it seems very clear here that what he's talking about is God and his keeping power. As I was reading this, I was reminded about John 17 and the high priestly prayer. And you remember that where Jesus prays before he goes to the cross and he's praying for his disciples. And he prays on their behalf and not on behalf of the world. He, he, he makes a distinction, but he prays for those whom you have given me. But listen to this in John chapter 17. In verse number 11, he says, I'm no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. The name which you have given me that I may be one even as we are. Now listen to this. While I was with them, Jesus says, I was keeping them in your name which you have given to me. And I guarded them. And none of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus knows that he's about to go to the cross. He's keeping the disciples. He's guarding the disciples. He's protecting the disciples. But this is a reminder that if we were left on our own, that as Peter would talk about, that Satan is like a, a roaring lion who would devour us. If we were left on our own, then certainly the evil one would come in and attempt to devour us. In other words, we need to be kept by the power of God. And so Jesus realizing that when he goes to the cross, he's not going to be able to keep them because he's taking on our sacrifice. He's taking upon our sins and so he asked the Father to guard them. 
again, it's a reminder, as Peter says, that we're protected by the power of God. Some versions say shielded. and it, God is the one who is keeping us. I was reminded also of this last verse, and I'll close with this, where Jude speaks about in his epistle, that short letter, and, and just to touch on how he begins and ends that letter, as Jude is addressing the called, the beloved to, in God, the fathering, and then he, he addresses them as kept for Jesus Christ. And that's why some think that the inheritance is Christ, because we're kept for Jesus. And the way that he ends this is a good reminder of the power of God and the mighty power by which he keeps us. And it's a good reminder why we should praise him because Jude ends with this word of praise in verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. He's able to keep us, and he's able to stump, keep us from stumbling. He's able to present us. I didn't plan to say this, but I was got into a discussion with our men today in our uh, study about I have a family member that um, who, who is dating someone that really is, uh, is a member of a, what I would call a cult. Um, it's, a, it's a false, a radical denomination. And I had a conversation with her the other day, and, and, and I, I would go back to this first, what Peter says, and even what Jude says. Am I worried about her being swept away. I mean, she's a professing believer. Am I worried about her being swept away into this cult? And I'm mindful that what we read in Peter and what we read in Jude and what we read in elsewhere is that God is the one who will keep us. God will protect us. That doesn't mean that we don't need to be on guard and we need to certainly watch what kind of teaching and listen, make sure that we're not falling into error. But if we are His, through faith in Christ, then He will ensure that we persevere to the end. He will keep us. So we continue in the faith, trusting that whatever may come our way, whatever even errors or heresies that may come, in the path of those whom we love who belong to Christ, that God will protect them and God will shield them and God will see them through. And we ought to praise God for his keeping power. Father, we do give thanks for the salvation that we have in Christ and Jesus. And we thank you that we have an inheritance that awaits for us, one that is not fading and will not perish and reserved and kept in heaven. But most especially, Lord, we thank you that you will keep us and protect us and keep us from stumbling and falling. That you will make us be able to stand in your presence one day because of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.